Welcome to Kuvulu, the sorcery of copper. In this episode, I will show you the spark counter. This is my custom electricity meter, which is measuring all the electricity which is going through the whole apartment. And it's not simply a electricity meter. What I've added to it is the capability of reading the data online. So here is the spark counter graphing, and we can see that we here can see the energy, which is corresponding to what is here. We can see the current voltage, which is right here, and we can even plot throughout time without how much power my home is consuming. So with that, let's get into the details. This is the power meter I will use to measure my electricity consumption. And it's pretty simple. It has four displays with seven segments. One for voltage, current, power, and then your energy consumption in kilowatt hour, which you can even reset using this button. It's the P-Sphere PZEM004 and well you can read the rest on the pack. It accepts voltages from 80 to 250 volts, 50 or 60 hertz, current from 0 to 100 amperes. So that's quite a lot of current. And the connections are also described on the back. So you just need to tap the mains input on these two things. So it has power and it can measure the voltage. Then there is this coil which they provide you. It's like this coil. You put the cable in this through this coil and then it can measure the power consumption. So this is described by the load here. And on the other side, you simply have the UART port. So you can query the measurements over, over serial. And for this huge measurement unit, I've paid a whopping $15 and yeah, for $15 I mean you, you get a lot of functionality. I wouldn't be able to build myself this device for $15. Here's the setup to see the device in action. So here we are again we have the power meter which is connected to mains. So here we have the connection to mains which goes to this plug. It's not on because the switch is off. So this provides power to the device and will also tell the voltage, will also be used to measure the voltage of the device. On the other side, we have the coil to measure the current path things through a line. And here, this is connected to mains and this goes to an, to an LED driver. It's a 36 watt LED driver and I've just passed one of the two lines powering this LED driver through this coil. And if we switch it on, now we can see that the device is on. It shows the current voltage, 231 volts. No current because, well, I didn't plug this one in, so there is nothing going through. I already consumed a bit of energy, but not much, and no power because there is no current. Um, to test it and to see how reliable this is, I will use this power meter. Um, I have a bit more faith in this one because it's it passed TÜV and GS, which are two German um, criterias and it's CE and not China export compared to this one and this is cheap China export. Um, I don't expect it to be very, very precise but at least it gives a rough measurement. Also there's a bit of a difference. This one's measure 100 amp and this one measures up to only 16 amps. This is a, this measures inline I think and not using a coil weight. This uses a coil and because of that the measurements are a bit less precise. So let's plug it in. And here we can already see there's a bit of a difference. This one tells that there's 227 volts, while this one tells there's 231 volts. And now we can go to the amps. This is the plug for the LED driver. If we put it on, the LEDs are on. And we can see I'm. this one measures a power con um, current flowing through this wire, or this plug of 0 0.14 amps. This one shows 0 to 19 amps, so this one is a bit off. Uh, I expect this one to be more precise because it measures in series, while this one uses a coil, which is a bit less precise. And also, this one is more adapted for low current reading. This one is more adapted for high current reading, going up to 100 amp. And if we could at the watts, that's fun. funny, because here we see we have a power consumption of 29 watts, 
while this walls we have a show of power consumption on 27 28 watts so this is a bit closer to these readings although this one is more off and the power factor is 0 0.91 of this LED driver, so it's pretty good. Uh, this one doesn't show the power factor, so we don't really know if we measured your active current or something else. Let's have a look at what is inside this power meter and see how simple or complicated, right, except it's a simple circuit inside. So for that, you'd simply have to remove the four screws which on the back, you can remove the front, and we can see that on the front side of the PCB, there's nothing except the four seven segment displays. The button, they say on off, but it's not on off. It's for resetting the the power. And then they even have sales screen telling which display does what. So that's that's a nice detail. And on the back, the circuit is pretty simple and it's based on a single IC, which is on the back here. Um, so here we have the voltage input. And you can see that one side is directly used as ground for the whole board, while the other side goes here. You can recognize because of this beefy line. Um, here we have a resistor. This is probably to measure the voltage of the um, input. And it goes through this resistor. This is probably the, the only protection which you have. Um, so this is the input protection. Then we have not a full bridge rectifier, but a simple diode. But it's enough probably because it doesn't consume a lot of power. So, And it's cheaper. So you have a simple diode, then we have a huge capacitor for the 400 volts. This, this tells us that it's for the uh, input. Novel is the brand. I don't know this brand. The power goes through this transformer then, once it's half rectified or once it's rectified. And you can... Notice there's a switch mode power supply because of this IC which is just next to it. This will output a PVM signal controlling what goes through this coil and not. And in the end the power will go to this capacitor, 25 volts, and then here we have a 78L05. This is a very simple low dropout voltage regulator providing 5 volt for the rest of the circuit. Um, here we have the input for measuring the current, and you can also recognize it because of the two lines going directly to one of the pins. But more importantly, there is a small resistor here. So how you measure current through going through a coil. Here we connect the coil, is you simply put a voltage, and this way you know the current which is, cons which is generated on the thing. And, based, and if you know the ratio of this coil, you know how much current is cons go through the wire which goes through the coil. You have also a lot of resistors and transistors, probably to measure diff different levels of voltage, current and so on, and to have some more precise measurements. This chip, uh, here we have the quality check passed, I think this is only to say that the chip works, not that it's precise. And we can see that this is an SDIC SD3004, and this is an all-in-one chip solution which measures current, voltage, goes, does the input, and then drives the four seven segment displays, or four times four seven segment displays. Here we have EEPROM, this is 24C02, so it's an I2C EEPROM, which is connected here probably to store the um, energy you consume, because it stays there even if you remove the power, as we've seen it. We have a buzzer, the buzzer is there for the alarm, you can over this port, you can set an alarm and say if you consume more than 2000 watts, please sound the alarm, that's why there is this beeper here, but it's really annoying because it also beeps whenever you send any command and um, it's, it's loud. Also what we've seen is that one of the input wires, so neutral or phase, is used directly as ground for this whole board and you can 
even verify it with the multimeter and the continuity tester. Not sure if you hear the beep, but if you go on one side and then, so this is the input, and then you touch the negative side of the capacitor, you see it beeps. So the negative side is connected to the neutral phase, so one of the AC inputs. This is not a floating, so the, the ground here is not floating, meaning on the output you have to be very cautious what you connect, because you will connect it maybe directly through to the mains, and actually they prevent us using these two optocouplers here. So, yeah, even if you have, if it's written ground, TX, RX, and VDD, these ports are completely separated from the rest of the board and also from the AC line by these optocouplers and through there you will only see the, um, the signal. So you cannot power the board using this port and you cannot get power out of it. It's simply there for transmitting the signal. That's basically it. So we see simple enough circuit. Now we want uh, to read out the measurements from this power meter to the computer and we will use the UART port for that. And this is why also I chose this model because I want to copy this data on the computer. And for that you simply connect a USB to serial adapter to the UART output. This is based on Scilab's CP2102 chip. They are pretty cheap and very reliable. Uh, you connect ground, VDD, TX, RX as it's written on there, so the TX here is the RX here. And then to communicate with this device, you simply follow the manual which is provided. Also, we can safely connect the computer to this thing because as we've seen, the UART is, has, is isolated using optocouplers from the mains input. So that's safe. Now, the manual tells you how it works. And on one side, you have the Chinese version, on the other side, you have the English version, which describes what the device is, uh, the, measure, the ranges it measures, and so on, how to connect through it. And here we have the commands. This table tells you the command to talk over URAT to, to read the measurements. So to read voltage, for example, to read current, to read the power, and so on. But this annoying thing in this is, although it provides you with the table to with the protocol, it doesn't tell you at which speed you have to talk to. Remember that UART is an asynchronous protocol, so they, doesn't, they don't share a clock, meaning both sides have to know at which data speed they have to, to talk so they can communicate. And here, the data speed is not provided. Now, I figured out in the end that it's 9,600 bits per second, 8 bits RAM, no parity bits, and one stop bit. But this is not provided in, in this thing. Well, also, what do you expect? I mean, it's cheap, but it's a small detail which they, which they don't provide. And another thing which took me a lot more time is that I've tried the commands which are provided here. So it's always seven byte data, request, and then you get the response with the measurement. So you can request the voltage, you get the response with the value, you can request a current and so on. And I was trying this with all the different speeds and all the different configuration, and it never replied, and I didn't understand why. In the end, I tried this command, set module address, because I was desperate, I wanted to try any other command, and they had replied. So, to be able to get the measurements out of the device, you first have to set the IP address. So as you can see here, we're setting 192.168.1.1. That's an IP address, and that matches the value C0A80101. And I didn't understand why you need to set an address to this device. Um, I mean, it's just a simple power meter, and you're directly connected over UART. But yeah, you have to set the address. And Whatever you set he uh, before you don't set any address, it will never reply. And whatever you set here, these values, you have to reuse them in the command. As you can see, C0A1, A8, 0101, it's used in every command, C0, A8, 0101. So you have to put the address every time, else it doesn't work. And you can just set any address you want, the four bytes, but you have to also update the checksum. And the checksum, as described here, is simply the sum of, the, of all bytes. So yeah, once you know that, once you know these two details which are not mentioned, 
you can implement it yourself. This is what I see on the left. It's a very simple script which sends the commands with the, which are described in the in the sheet. Get value, um, get voltage, get current, but get power. And now we will switch it on. Up. So here the device is switched on. And if I ask for it, you see I'm setting the address. I get the voltage, 232.2. This is corresponding to what was here. Current, we have no current there. Power, also no power. And this is not voltage, actually. This is energy. There's a bug in my script. Nine, um, nine watt hour, what's also written here. And now if we connect the LED driver, up here we see that we have 19 amp, z 0 0.90 amps power consumption. And if I request again, we see 0 0.99 power consumption, 28 watt power consumption. Still the bug in there. But yeah, it works pretty nice. And as you could see, the, the beeper, it beeps at every command you send. And this is really annoying, particularly because I want to record these values every second. So yeah, quite annoying. I don't want to have this power meter connected over USB the whole time to my computer because this means that if I want constantly to read the values, I always need the computer to have connected to it. That's one thing. And the other thing is that um, the computer has to be near to where this is. So wherever, wherever I place it through my house or wherever I need to measure, I need to have, because of this short leads, the computer next to the power meter. And this is un unuseful because I don't have one computer to waste just to read the values out of these things. So what I decided to do is simply use a microcontroller. So this is an Arduino Nano board or a clone of it with an Atmega AT321P. And this will perfectly do the job because it has a serial port here. So I can connect it over serial to the power meter just there. And then I can send the values over radio to wherever my computer is. And to send it over radio, I will use one of these chips. This is a Nordic NRF 24L01. It's a very, very inexpensive radio transceiver. It operates on the 2.4 GHz ISM band. It costs less than $1 per chip. And you simply control it over SPI. And this microcontroller can talk over SPI. I think the ports are somewhere here. <coughs> so I will read out the values over UART and send it over SPI through the wires to my computer. And my computer will have the same thing to receive the values and to store them wherever my computer is. And this is how the final setup look like. looks like. So here we have the power meter check connected over UART to the microcontroller here's the microcontroller the development board sitting behind all these cables then the microcontroller is also connected to this radio transceiver this NRF24 but this operates this microcontroller and this board operates at 5 volts this operates at 3.3 .3 volts, although all I.O. pins are 5 volt tolerant, it needs to operate at 3.3 .3 volts. Luckily, on these Arduino Nano boards, there is a um, USB to serial converter to talk serial to this and the USB port and providing a USB port. And this has a 3.3 .3 volt output, which is required for the 3.3 .3 volt signals, which are on USB. And the, uh, the, the pin is available on the side. If we look here if you focus please focus here we have 3.3 volt output so i use the 3.3 volt output but because it doesn't have a lot of power and normally it's simply meant to talk usb i'm putting a capacitor so whenever i transmit i have enough charge for this quick transmission to send it and so i don't overload the the um, usb to serial converter or the voltage regulator which is within this converter. Else you might just lose connection to this device or lose radio um, or the, the packets will not be transmitted over the radio and so on.
And finally, here I have a logic analyzer. And this is really useful to debug communication and see what is happening. For example, you have to wait. Uh, you cannot chain the commands and it will do one after the other. You have to wait. You send a command, you wait until it responds, and then you send the next command. If you send too many commands, it will not queue it and it will use track. And communication will be broken. Also, it's the first time I've implemented uh, SPI for this chip, and I'm not using any library, neither, or not using the Arduino IDE or any library. I'm programming everything in C and writing to registers myself. Same for this one. I implemented SPI using the simple Atmega datasheet and using the Nordic NRF24 datasheet, I implemented the protocol to stick with it. And to see what's happening and to see if the transmission are right, this logic analyzer is quite useful and I'll show you how to use it. This is the setup I've been using to develop the code. As I said, I, I implemented everything myself, talking to this power meter, controlling this um, RF transceiver, and yeah, that's basically it, um, using SPI. So the source code will also be, be, be available. And what I want to show this time is that to develop new protocols or to debug some communication, it's pretty useful to use a logic analyzer. Here I'm using a very cheap silly logic analyzer clone. So this is not original silly logic, but you get it for $8 or something like that. It has the same chip though and is pretty pretty useful. Uh, I'm not using the logic software, although it's a good software, but since I don't have the original, I don't think uh, using the original software is, is fair. And there's an alternative which uses a different firmware for this chip, which it works not so nice, but good enough for, for what I need. So logic analyzer simply will monitor on the different pins. So here I've connected to the SPI, TX and RX pin, um, what the signal level is, so how high or low, and this way you can see the data. For example, if I restart the chip, I run it, you can, we can see here there's some traffic on the lines going. Um, here I've labeled the lines already. Here we have RX and TX, these are the two UART ports. Then we have master input slave slave output, master output, slave input, slave select, and slave clock, which are lines for the um, SPI to talk to the RF transceiver. CE is to enable transmitting and receiving on this transceiver. IAQ is uh, an additional pin where the transceiver would tell you if transmission has been completed or if it has received some data and so on. And there are not a lot of libraries which support actually this IAQ pin. Most of the time they pull over SPI. Is there any new data? Has the transmission been successful and so on. But since I developed the code on my own, I could implement this IAQ. And because most of the code is interrupt driven on the microcontroller, um, I like this. It makes it a bit more tricky, but more more fun to develop. I use also the IAQ, so I'm sleeping most of the time, except when there's an interrupt like IAQ telling me that data has been received or not. <laughs> and if we look in details here, we can see the RX and TX line, but if we look in details in the clock, we see the clock is not regular, uh, very regular. And this is because we're not sampling fast enough. So this, um, this logic analyzer can sample up to 24 megahertz with eight channels. Here we're using all eight channels. And I just sample at one megahertz and we can see that we skipped some some bits or some tails. So you just have to increase the um, sampling rate of the signal to get some better results. And if we start again, let's zoom out. Here we start at zero. If we now start again, run. Here we see the communication. Top. And here we can see that the clock looks a lot nicer. It looks more like a clock. So that's one tricky detail you might miss when, when debugging. So the higher the better, but then it consumes also more data and and so on. I, I think two megahertz were worth quite okay. So it shows you the signals which are 
on the um, on the lines and at least you can see if there is some activity or not but what's even better is that logic analyzer comes generally with some software which is able to decode the data and here it's in decoder so we can add a decoder for example uart because we have uart with the two pins rx tx the board rate is 9600 bits per second eight data bits no parity bits and one stop bit and if we look at it we can see it starts decoding and here decoded some data already and this is exactly what we've seen in the demo code previously it's setting the address although though here is something broken oh no it's because it's showing some ascii signs and we want hexadecimal oh it has to calculate again so let's wait a bit here you can see it goes through the data and tries to decode it and this is it's not so fast it's okay though so here we see exactly the data so we're setting the address now we are transmitting the signal but we are not receiving anything on the other side so we know that there is some kind of issue with the arx line or the device has some issue and in this case the device is not on so it will not be able to reply let's try again with now switching on the device so the device is switched on i'm pressing reset so i don't miss the start run and here we can see there's already some some noise we can stop up switch off because it's really too noisy and we can see the traffic so here again we are waiting until UART has been decoding this is our transmission data as we can see we're setting the address and this time we're receiving the data from the power meter this is the acknowledgement that the address has been set and you can see every bit so these are the bits on top of it this is the hexadecimal start stop bit and it's really useful to to decode protocols and to figure out what the issue could have been now the lines here on the bottom are the spi um, commands which are a bit faster but we can also add a decoder for that uh, spi decoder so here i've restarted Pelview because it crashed and I've added the SPI protocol decoder with the clock, the MISO, the MOSI, the chip select, and then the other protocol details, which are polarity, phase bit order, and so on. And we can start sampling. So let's reset again. Starts, here we see some activity, here more activity. And here we can see that there's some decoded data. And if we look closely at it, we again see all the bits we need so here all the time you you start by selecting the device which is here the slave select in spi afterwards uh, whatever you're sending something master output slave input you're sending something and meanwhile you can receive data on the master input slave output device and the clock is just to tell when data is available and not available and here we can see that it decodes pretty nicely with the bits and then the return value so here you can see if you're sending the the right data and so on but these are just the spi um these are just the spi raw data it doesn't decode the the protocol by itself now even better than pulse view we've seen this is a bit buggy it's actually i really love SIGROC because it allows me to to do a lot more things and particularly based on terminals and get access to the raw data so except of saying so s watching the signals going up and down is quite useful for beginning of debugging but uh, then if you want to debug the messages themselves more than the protocol um, it's really nice to have the messages coming out of the of the terminal and for example here I will um, just show you how to decode spa data so you just call sigrock cli which comes a uh, command line interface log level is just to show more details warnings if there are some bindings warnings the driver is the fx2 the fx2 is the chip which is used in these silly logic clones we want to use channel four five six and seven this is where um miso mozi ss and uh, sck are we are asking for a sample rate of four mega samples uh, megahertz we are asking for 10 mega samples 
Um, and then we can specify protocol decoders. This time we only want the SPI decoder. Um, and here we're setting which pin is what. So the chip select is pin is channel six, the clock is channel seven, the MOSI is channel five, and the MISO is channel um, four. And then you can specify w what data you want to output. For example, here in the protocol decoder annotation for SPI, I said, okay, only give me MISO data and MOSI data. Don't give me the bits, don't give me the clock, uh, and so on, and output everything in hex. So now if I connect it, if I connect the logic analyzer, up, logic analyzer connected. Let's start this, let's start. And here you can see the data, so this is really nice. Now it's doing all the samples, and we can see from beginning on, this is the first byte I've sent. This is the first byte I, I received. So this is me, uh, Mozi. Actually, it's the other way around. This is the Miso data, Miso byte. This is the Mozi byte, Miso byte, Mozi byte, and so on. And so you can put on top of that another um, program or another script which you can write yourself. So you can just pass this data and then show only the relevant things you want and filter out a lot of things. And this simplifies a lot decoding um, and finding out problems not in the protocol in the bit level, but in the commands you send and so on. And on top of that, what um, so on top of exporting data which you can pipe in other programs it comes even with a lot of decoders it's not only just SPI but you can stack decoders so on top of SPI we have this NR NRF 24 L0 one chip but Sigrog or more particularly the lib Sigrog decode library comes with a decoder partic ex exactly for this chip so it's on top of SPI and what you say is that protocol decoder I want SPI here in the channels and on top of SPI I want the NRF decoder. Now if I connect again, logic analyzer, let's start decoding, start the microcontroller and here you can see that it already decodes everything. So from the byte we have seen in the beginning, now it's decoding the whole protocol for this NRF chip and I can see what is happening. So this is really useful. And adding, writing decoders is not too hard actually. These are Python scripts which are pretty well documented so you can add protocols decoder on top of this one by yourself um, for Sigrog and then publish them if you want or you can just pipe the data. And this is the same thing which are really, really enough for, for scripting uh, and when you debug a lot instead of pressing all the time. And, uh, and I don't think that a lot of other software are able to export the data as easily and also to stack the decoders. Um, so that, yeah, that was a quick introduction to logic analyzers and how useful they are to, to decode protocols. But let's come back to the power meter. So now the first part is done. We have the power meter, we know the protocol, we have the microcontroller to read from it, and the microcontroller will transmit it using this chip. But now I, will, I, have, I need the other side. So the idea was to have a computer, but I don't, again, don't want to have a computer sitting all the time just with this chip and recording the, the data. So what I did is that I'm, I'm using a Raspberry Pi. It's a single board computer. Uh, which is not too expensive, which is actually quite inexpensive now. And I've connected the same chip, the NRF, on the SPI port. And then using, this time I'm using the library, um, the NRF or the RF24 library, I can read the data out and store it on the SD card. And because it doesn't consume a lot of power and because it's small, I can just put it in a corner with the receiving antenna and it will receive all the time the data and just log it on, on the SD card for, for a long time. So on the Raspberry Pi, I implemented the receiving part. The NRF 24L01 is connected to the SPI port and this time I didn't re-implement the, uh, the whole NRF stack, but I've I've, I took the one provided by the RF24 library. Um, <coughs> the program will simply use this library to open the communication, ask for data, receive data. This time no interrupts are used, 
but it will simply ask periodically for um, if data is available and once it's available it will dis just display it again i will provide the the program in git but it's pretty simple it's it, it's a very short one and here we can see that we are receiving the data from the um, um from the power meter and from the microcontroller sending the values over the air so every time i show the current current consumption of, well all the values are sent and because it's on raspberry pi i have a lot of space to store it on the sd card in this case i don't store it as raw text or as raw values i'll directly put the data into a time series based database called InfluxDB. For that I use curl requests, but what's useful is that in this database I can then use it with other programs such as Grafana for example. So Grafana is a nice program to plot time series based data and so on. And this is what you can see here now. Um, I'm reading all the time the last values of the energy, so the whole energy I consumed, the current voltage, as you see, as you've seen, it's just changed there, and this is the power consumption. So this is the number of watts I used per time, and we are around 30, just below 30 watts, because I'm still using only the um, LED driver. So, yeah, and I can store this value and see over time how much, how much I use. So it's really, really useful. I quite like it. The reason why I started working on this project and started building the spark counter power meter was simply because of this. When I moved in this flat, I had a really nice old fashioned electricity meter where I could see the wheel spin and see what my current power consumption was, or at least my total energy consumption was in what hours. I could note down the values with pen and paper and see over time how much I used Power. Now you can also see that the distribution board on top is pretty old, it was pretty old. And even all the power lines which were coming into this distribution panel were, was, were old. So they decided to change everything and to put a new distribution panel. I mean, previously you had these fuses. That's the first time I've seen these old fashioned fuses. It's not breakers, but these are fuses, 10 amps. And here we have 16 amps. So this is the new distribution board. We can open it and now we have clean a clean panel with breakers a bit everywhere. So it looks really nice. Now the problem is that at the same time they also removed the electricity meter. See? There's nothing there anymore. So <clears throat> at the same point they, they, they took out the electricity meter and replaced it with a new smart meter and the new smart meter so the digital electricity meter is now in a room somewhere in the basement and I don't have any access to it I don't have the key so I cannot read out my thing again and this smart meter are now a must in in Germany so whenever you replace you have to put a new smart meter in probably there are some exception but with this smart meter the company providing you the electricity can read out the value but you first I don't have access anymore because there's nothing here anymore but I cannot read out the value myself so that, that's kind of a pain and that's why I decided to build a spark counter because I still wanted to see how much electricity I was consuming so we will plug this 100 ampere power meter here um, there and this way I can measure again my power energy consumption. Now oh, a quick introduction to distribution boards and to these breakers. These breakers are for each segment of the house. So probably this is the living room, this could be the kitchen and so on. Here we have a B20 and on top we see 20 amps. So whenever there is more than 20 amps going through this segment, so if I consume more than 20 amps in my living room, then the breaker will simply break to protect things because it thinks that there is, um, there is a short somewhere and this is why these 20 amps have gone through it. So either you consume too much power and you have a too big engine or there was a 20 amp power, um, power consumption and then this 
breaker tripped to protect you. Here this one is for 20 amp and you can see B B16, this one is for 60 amp and from for another thing. And if you want to switch it on again, once you've removed the short or what consumed too much, you just put it on. So it's a, a, it's a lot more different than these kinds of things, these kinds of breakers. And distributes to the small segments and this huge thing here distributes to these small segments. You can see here that it's rated for 40 amps, so it's a lot more current. And the 40 amps are distributed among all these then smaller segments. But it has another writing on it, and this is the earth leakage protection. So what happens is that it will measure the difference between the currents going in and the current going back again. And if the difference is too high, it means that something is leaking. So that some power, instead of going back from neutral, leaks somewhere else. And this is, prob this is most of the time Earth. And if too much power is leaking, it's, uh, it will trip the wire because the shot somebody could be electrocuted and so on. And this is what you've seen, uh, and this is what you see here. So, and this one will trip if you consume more than 30 milliamp. So it's, it's a bit more. And 30 millimens doesn't sound a lot, but it, it's still at 230 volts, so it can, it can do quite some damage. But that's the, that's the earth protection. And here you have a small button. This is actually to test the earth protection. And you should test it from time to time. And if I put, a, uh, the, if I put it here, it's not this breaker didn't break because of the 40 amp power consumption, but the breaker break because there was more than 30 milliamp leakage. So yeah, this is a little bit of discussion. But now we'll open it and we will see where we can plug the power meter on. This is how the distribution panel looks like once it's opened. And before I play with electricity, I want to take most precautions so I don't get electrocuted. I switched off all the breakers. I'm using uh, latex gloves. So it's harder for me to touch directly the metal. I'm using long sleeves so I don't touch and uh, my skin doesn't touch any other metal by accident. I'm using long um, screwdrivers with isolation up to a thousand volts if I want to, to play with something. I'm using rubber shoes and I'm only using one hand if I have to do something inside. This way I don't have the two hands and the possibility of current going um, from one side to the other side through your heart and electrocuting. But and even if all these things are broken, the power coming in is still coming in. These are these huge beefy lines here. And I cannot switch it off because I don't have access to this to the to the basement where the main switch is. So that's the distribution box and you can clearly see why it's called the distribution box because it distributes everywhere the, the electricity everywhere. This is the input which you see here, the four cables. They are going to this small distribution. So we have three, you have brown, black and gray. These are the three phases as far as I know, because here they are going black again. And then we have one neutral, which is common to all of them. And it's uh, distributed in different ways. So here we have one neutral and one phase this phase, which are going to this breaker. And you need neutral in phase because you want to measure if there's any difference and trip if there is some um, current difference and there is some earth leakage. And after that, the, here you can see the phase is going in here. It's going through there and it's going to, to the breaker. And then the breaker just continues giving the phase to whatever is, is connected on here. We have the same thing here. We have one, two, three phases which are coming in. One neutral, again, to measure the difference. And the three phases are then distributed to all of these small breakers. Then you have the, the electricity going to the different rooms using these cables here. And this is only for the phase. For the electricity to come back, or come back, this is, uh, come back to neutral, they will come back here and then these things are connected to, these, to this output and this output. Here you see the output going here for the four poles. And you see this output going here for the two poles. 
That's why it's called distribution. And now we want to put this coil somewhere where we can measure the current which is used by all of these wires. The problem is that this is a solid ferret ring with, um, with the coil inside and you have to pass the cab cables through it and it's pretty small. There is also some alternative which are these things which are split core um, split, split core. So here we have the ferret core which is cut and split and here on the back you see the, um, the coil or the transformer. But I don't know the turn ratio of this thing so I cannot just clip on this thing. I will still use this. Now I cannot put this on all of these wires because they are just scattered everywhere like here here and I it's hard to access and I don't see where, where this goes. I also can't, uh, can, I could put it on the common uh, neutral here because they are almost all here. So that would be a possibility, but then these wires are too short. And there are a lot of tiny wires which I have, have, uh, would have to put through. And I could put through the three or the three main wires, the four main wires through this one these three main wires. This is too small. But what I will do is just put the wire on this neutral here. We have one neutral which is the same for everyone and the current will go so this this neutral and this neutral go back here and this go back to the main distribution in the house. And this is just one wire neutral and this will fit perfectly just right here so I can put my electricity meter just there. And that's uh, what I will do. Hopefully nothing goes wrong. So here's the power meter. I've mounted it in the second box so I can put it right there and have everything I can read. And here's the back. I have did two modifications uh, on this power meter. First, I removed the buzzer because it's just too annoying hearing this buzz all the time. And then I've added some power. So this is directly tapping, taping off the second capacitor after the transformer. So there are 10 volts on there. And this way I can also power the microcontroller with, with it because this one has already an, a transformer. This will power the in of the microcontroller so and the microcontroller, the Arduino nano board has a, a, also a voltage regulator. Now I've measured it, it's 10 volts but now we have to be really aware that it's 10, that the ground is of this 10 volt is one of these two lines here. So Everything which we will connect to here, so this will be This is the Arduino, which we will put in uh, in here. Here we will have the voltage input and this one will, this ground will be connected to the one of the AC lanes. So all of this will be floating. Um, I've also... Track. D2, yeah. I've also made it a lot smaller. I just have the capacitor for the RF board there and then a capacitor on the input voltage, uh, a really small one. Here is the RF, here is serial and here is power. And because this will be, um, the ground of this will be on, on one of these AC lines, I will put the whole thing into a box. So where I cannot touch or and so no one can directly touch the thing and get electrocuted. So I'll do that and I'll show you the results in the end. And voila, the job is done. So here we have the power meter, which shows the current consumption. Everything is switched on. 
the spark counter module is just right there and it's transmitting over radio the raspberry pi is recording everything and as we can see here we can see the power consumption 24 watt hours which we see here the voltage which corresponds this is the current current and this is the power consumption and we can see we are at 100 106 something like that and now i can plot my power consumption all the time